God's people said, amen, amen, and amen. So wonderful having the worship team back together today. So I'm telling you, just feel it. It's so, so good. Good morning. Welcome, everybody. Thanks for inviting us into your living room wherever you are today. My name is Mark Sorensen. I'm the lead pastor here at Harvest. And let me also just say happy Father's Day to the dads out there selfishly. I would love to say happy Father's Day to my own father, Ethan Sorensen. I know this may come as a shock to many of you. I was not an easy child to raise, even though I was perfect in every way. Um, I love to remind people that when I was a kid, (laughs) I was brought to you by the letters A, D, H, and D before any doctors or medical professionals knew those letters went together. Um, But my father's humility and his gentleness and just his love for the Lord really has, has, has impacted me in such a way that I am the man I am today because of, of him. So to my father, who watches from a leather chair in front of a giant big screen TV, and who still to this day, when I am preaching, will text me and say, time for you to get a haircut. Happy Father's Day, <laughs> Dad. And to, and to all of the men out there, I don't know about your father. We, we've said this today, and it, it's so true. Lo, Lo mentioned this. I, I don't know if there's a high bar or if your father just wasn't there, but where we can land today is this truth, that we do have a heavenly father who is a good, good father, and there is always something to celebrate. Hey, let me ask you a question. Have you ever just experienced a duh moment in your life? You may call them blonde moments. I'm blonde going gray, so I'm not gonna say that. I'm gonna say a duh moment. A duh, D-U-H moment, is that moment when there is something that's going on, a crisis, something breaks down, and the answer as to why this is happening is so obvious. It's right there in front of your face. You're just too close to to miss it. Well, I I had one of those dumb moments this week. It was actually Tuesday morning. I I woke up, and it it was warm in our house. Now, that's not normal. If you've ever stayed at our house overnight, then you know we make you sign a waiver releasing us from liability in the event you freeze to death because my wife loves for the temperature to be very, very cold. Now, I can say this. We're coming up on 27 years of marriage. Secret that has worked well for me, two things. Number one, yes, dear. That carries a lot of weight. And number two, Pick your battles. Choose your battles wisely. So, look, how I answer the really coldness in our house at night, I sleep under a 15-pound anxiety blanket. I'm in a parka, footed PJs. I'm a happy camper. But when I woke up Tuesday morning and I felt like I just finished running a marathon and I looked at the temperature in the living room and I saw it's 10 degrees warmer in the house than it was supposed to be, Houston, we have a problem. And it's 2020, so immediately the world was ending for me again. I go to my wife. I'm like, we've got to relocate. We've got to move. We've got to withdraw all the money from the retirement account. We've got to cut the kids off. My daughter was like, wait, what? We've got we to gotta sell a car. I'm sure it's the black mold. We can't even live in this house anymore. It's horrible. And my wife just says, God bless her, take a breath. Simma down now. She's like, let's just call the AC people. Let's see what's going on. So I make the call within two or three hours. Jonathan shows up, bless him. He comes inside the house and he's got the, you know, it's, it's the age of COVID, so the booties and he's got the mask on. And for people like me who are hearing impaired, it's a nightmare because I love to see mouths when people talk to me. But Jonathan was semi-shouting at me because I shared with him the hearing aids. And, and he said, all right, where's the, where's the unit? I said, it's outside the house. He said, okay, um, where's the attic? And I said, it's right around the corner. And he's like, don't worry, Mr. Sorensen, we're going to get this taken care of. And he turns around and he stops. And then he turns back and he says, hey, I know this is obvious and I'm sure you've done this. But when's the last time you changed your filter? And I said, I'm sorry. He said, your filter. When's the last time you've changed your filter? And what came out of my mouth were these words, fairly recently? Like I said it like a question. And I'm there when Jonathan, who I think sensed my tone, 
climbs this ladder that I gave him, and he opens that little grate, and there's the filter. I'm not kidding. When I say it looked like there were 10 cats that were shoved up in that hole, it was like a mink coat was up there. PETA would have had serious issues. And he sees this, and I'm like, and he looks at me. I can't tell if he's smiling, but he says this back at me. Fairly recently, right? It was bad. But you know, I learned something. I knew that I'm supposed to change the filter. Anything, by the way, that's going wrong these days, blame 2020. 2020 is going to take it. I knew I was supposed to change the filter. It's just been kind of a crazy year. But I'm, I'm taking this filter out, this nasty, nasty filter, and I'm setting it in the trash can. And as I'm turning away, it's like I felt the Spirit stop me and say, you know, sin can do the same thing to your heart. And I just had a moment standing in the backyard. And I really started thinking about that. I truly believe it was the Holy Spirit saying, listen, just like you gotta take care of this air filter in your home, the air conditioner unit can't do what it's intended to do if it's clogged up, if it's not breathing. And the truth is, when you think about the Holy Spirit, when you think about how the Holy Spirit wants to use us, if there is sin that is covering up our heart little by little, if we're not inviting the Spirit in to do the work, to address the sin, to allow the Spirit to stretch us and mold us, we are not gonna be the aroma of Christ that we were created to be. I thought about Psalm 139. Listen to what the psalmist says. When you wanna talk about checking the filter of your heart, the psalmist says this, search me, O God, and know the filter of my heart. I'll add that. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. Will you see if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting? What this is, what we've been doing over the past couple of weeks, it's, it's not a political thing, it's just a sin thing. We're, we're talking about sin. We're inviting the Holy Spirit to do the needed work in our own lives personally to address those things that need to be addressed. And listen, it's uncomfortable, but sin, if you don't address it in your life, not only can it cause discomfort, but it can cause destruction to the people in you, to you personally, and to the people around you. So listen, my request this morning is if there's anything that we talk about within the context of this message that challenges you, if there's anything that we say that pushes you out of your comfort zone just a little bit or a whole lot, before you email me, before you call me, before you text me, I want you to start with this question. Are you ready? Holy Spirit, what are you teaching me right here in this moment? Because I think the Holy Spirit really is stirring up an awakening. I believe that this is a time of hope. I believe right now it's not our darkest time. I think this is a defining moment for the church. And that's what Contagious, this series, is all about. We started on Pentecost Sunday. We're looking at on the other side of the Holy Spirit. How when Jesus said in Acts 1-8, when the Spirit comes, it'll come in power. And you will be my, my witnesses in all of Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So if you have your Bibles today, I would love for you to open them up. Because today, I'm so excited to be preaching from Acts chapter 10. When you talk about checking the filter of your heart, there's actually someone that needed to do a little sin work in his life. And it, it wasn't a pagan, it was actually somebody that you may have heard of. His name is Simon Peter. There's something in Acts 10 that happens where God has to work on Peter's heart, a bias that existed, possibly a prejudice that was present in Simon Peter's life. And this is life-changing, and it's transformational. And I just drove onto the campus this morning with this thought that God could have chosen anyone to preach this word today from Acts chapter 10, but my name was on the page for this particular Sunday. Thank you, Jesus. So I am excited to present good news because this today 
Any time we reveal the good news of the gospel, it will always be good news. So can I say a prayer before we dive in today? Let me pray right now. Just close your eyes. Gracious and loving God, I thank you so much for your covenant, your covenant that's so strong. And Father, I thank you so much that, that we have these stories. I thank you for your inspired holy word that, God, we can look back to these moments recorded, documented over 2,000 years ago. And, and Father, there's such hope in seeing how you moved and how you stretched your people. Because that story then is the same story for us today. This overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. Lord, you are still kicking down the doors of injustice and you are calling your people to go boldly into places where the good news of Jesus can be declared. So God, if this is a word of holy discontent, then I stand on the authority of your word and Father, thank you for stirring up the waters because you love us too much to leave us where we are. You do. You call us to more. So as long as there is breath in our lungs, may we as the people of God continue to be learning, continue to be saying, Holy Spirit, what are you saying? And may we continue to be a people that move, Father. Because this is how the gospel reaches us today and this is how the gospel will continue to reach the next generation as long as we step up and step out in faith. So Lord, we love you, we praise you and it's in your name that we say amen and amen. All right, Acts chapter 10. If you're a note taker, there's two things I want you to know about Acts chapter 10. Number one, it is the longest narrative that you find. The story of Peter and Cornelius. Luke, who wrote the book of Acts, spends more time talking about this one specific narrative than any other story that you find in Acts that tells you that there's something important that's happening in Acts chapter 10. It actually moves into Acts chapter 11. Today I'm just focusing on 10. That's one thing. More time devoted to this story than any other. The second thing is this one. Commentators, scholars, they all agree on one thing. That Acts chapter 10, the message I'm preaching from today, is the most important chapter that you find in the entire book of Acts. Think about this. The most important chapter. And some of them would actually say that out of the entire Bible, this is one of the most important chapters. And why? Because within this chapter, it's the moment that the gospel, which was primarily thought of in Jewish terms, moves to a gospel for the entire world world. Lines are erased. God doesn't see borders. He sees a people that he loves, and this is the moment where it takes place. So Acts chapter 10, if you think of it like a play, there's primarily three scenes that you see develop in Acts 10. Scene number one, you've got the story of Cornelius. Scene number two, you have the story of Simon Peter and what God is doing with him. And scene number three, you have this moment where Peter and Cornelius are together in his house. So it's scene three that I want to read for you in just a moment, but I got to give you the backstory. so let me do a little bit of work, just make a couple observations to catch us up to where I think the Spirit wants us to, to hone in and to focus on today. So let's talk about Cornelius. This is where the story starts. Acts chapter 10, in the very beginning, Luke tells us that in Caesarea, there was a man there by the name of Cornelius who was a Roman centurion. Now... Caesarea, if you've ever been to the Holy Land with us here at the church, that the first place that you go on this trip typically is Caesarea by the sea. It, it's beautiful. It was named after Caesar Augustus, heavily fortified. It was a main port. A lot of people traveled in, and it had a lot of, of Roman influence, which is why you find Cornelius, this Roman centurion, high up in the guard, over a hundred men. He was a Gentile who lived in this predominantly Gentile, Roman-driven place. Now, Luke says something else interesting about Cornelius. Three things. Number one, he feared God. Number two, he gave his alms to the poor. He helped the needy. And number three, 
he was devout in prayer. Now, that's pretty incredible for a Gentile if you want to be honest about it, right? Because even though he feared God, there were places within a Jewish context, remember, in the temple, there were places that only Jews could go. So the fact that Cornelius was a Gentile, he feared God, he gave money to the poor, that he was devout in prayer, these are incredible things. But remember, a good person who believed in God, but he was missing salvation. Why? Because we know salvation comes through the acceptance of Jesus Christ. Sometimes I think we forget that. There are good people, yes, but remember, Jesus makes all the difference in the Christian story, so we want to make sure people know about Jesus Christ. That is our hope and our message. But what I love about this story Really, it's incredible. Cornelius, this Gentile, is, is reaching out to God only to find that God is actually seeking him out. And this incredible thing happens. An angel visits Cornelius. Now listen. This angel says, Cornelius, the Lord has heard your prayers. The Lord has seen how you've given your alms to the poor. The Lord knows who you are. So there is a man in Joppa by the name of Simon Peter. God wants you to go and to send people to retrieve Simon Peter to come back because Simon Peter has a message that he needs to give you. Now, press pause in the story. Because as I'm reading Acts chapter 10, isn't it interesting, right? Remember, Gentiles are about to find out that they are a part of God's greater plan. This is a, an incredible, crazy shift in thinking. Isn't it interesting? Because God could have taken this moment to tell Cornelius, guess what? Good news. Gentiles are in. So I need you to go to Simon Peter and tell him what I have told you. He didn't do that. He said, I need you to go and get Simon Peter because Simon Peter has a message that he needs to bring you. It wasn't unlike God to go beyond the normal people, the ones you would expect him to speak to, to bring good news. Remember, we go back to the Christmas story. We love Christmas in the Sorensen household. Half thinking we're going to put up our tree sooner than later. But remember, it was the shepherds. It was the nomads, the ones who were smelly that couldn't go into the church. They were the ones the angels said, good news of great joy for all people. But why not tell Cornelius that? I'm going to make the case in a moment because I believe that God still had some work to do on Simon Peter's heart. There were things in the filter of his heart that needed to be addressed. It's incredible. So Cornelius gets that visit from an angel and he's obedient. He sends servants to go to Joppa to retrieve Simon Peter. Now, it's the next day. It's noon. Simon Peter is on the roof of the house that he is staying. He's staying at a place, um, uh, Simon the Tanner is the home where he was staying with Simon. So Simon Peter is on the roof. I believe he's hangry. It's about lunchtime, and he is praying to the Lord. Now I want you to hear, he's praying. Simon Peter was a man of prayer. I believe that just as Simon Peter was praying, was asking for discernment, we'll see. The Spirit speaks to him. The Spirit guides him. The Spirit speaks truth to him. That when we, as the people of God, are Spirit-led today, when we're starting our day and we're saying, Lord, what do you have in store for me? Spirit, what do you want to say to me? That what the Spirit did then, the Spirit still does today when we're obedient to leaning in to the Spirit's leading in our life. Simon is on the roof, he's praying, and he goes into a trance. And he has this vision. Here's the vision. A sheet descends from heaven with four corners. Many believe that just stands for north, south, east, and west. This is a whole world vision that he's having. And on the sheet that lowers before him, you have all kinds of animals and reptiles and birds, and the Spirit says, Simon Peter, kill and eat. Now, you're from Texas. You're reading this. You're like, barbecue. Okay, y'all, let's go. Right? That's easy for us to say, okay. But hold on. 
radical shift you need to understand from a Jewish perspective. What does Peter do the first time he gets this vision? He says, eh, no. Lord, I'm not going to do that. Why? Because there were Levitical laws. In Leviticus, I think it's chapter 11, in Deuteronomy, God is very specific to his chosen people, the Jewish people, that there are clean foods you can eat and there are unclean foods that you should never eat. So Peter gets this radical vision that changes everything. He's like, no, there's no way. Second time, get it, same vision, sheet comes down from heaven. Peter, kill and eat. Peter says no. And look at what happens. This verse is up here because it's important you see it. The voice spoke to him a second time. Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. Hear it. Don't call anything impure that God has made clean. Are you ready? Here it comes. Second time. A third time, rather. The sheet descends, and the voice says, Peter, kill and eat. Three times he gets this vision. I have to think, side note, Simon Peter hated the number three, or he loved it. Because it's almost as if God just continued to speak to him in threes. Maybe it was the third time it happened, he went, oh. Like this was his dumb moment that God was saying something. And as awesome as he got that vision three times, don't miss this, because this is God showing off. Are you ready? Knock at the door. The visitors that Cornelius sent were knocking at the door. Guess how many were at the door? Somebody say it. Three. Three Gentiles show up at the door with a message for Simon Peter that says this. Hey, um, Cornelius, a Gentile in Caesarea, had this vision and the Lord said you had something to tell him. Do you get it? It's huge. What's happening in Peter's life right now, what's happening in Peter's heart right now is an entire shift in theology. It's an entire shift in thinking. The Lord is stretching him in ways that he had no idea he was going to be stretched. So what did he do? He ate lunch. <laughs> He told these men that had traveled for a long distance, you guys have to be exhausted. You just traveled on foot 20 miles. They went all night. He said, let's just enjoy the day together. And tomorrow, I want to go to Cornelius' house because there's some things that apparently the Lord thinks I need to share. All right, that's scene one and scene two. Hopefully, that whets your appetite for what's about to happen. Now, um, full disclosure, I'm reading this from the message translation. Um, you know, if you're studying the word, um, NRSV, ESV, there are translations that you want to start with. I'm saying that because sometimes, for some reason, the message just fires people up. But I love to read from different translations, sometimes because I just see things a little bit differently. It's worded differently. And the way the message just writes the story, the way Eugene Peterson translates it, it's just beautiful. So here's the, here's the moment. Starting in Acts chapter 10, if you're following along, verse 23. The next morning he, we're talking about Simon Peter, got up and he went with them. And some of his friends from Joppa went along. A day later, they entered Caesarea. And Cornelius was expecting them and had his relatives and close friends waiting with him. Surprise, it's a party. The minute Peter came through the door, Cornelius was up on his feet greeting him, and then get it, down on his face, and he was worshiping Simon Peter. This is what I love about his heart. Peter pulled him up and he said, hey, 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 none of that. I'm a man and only a man. I am no different from you. So talking things over, they went on into the house where Cornelius introduced Peter to everyone who had come. And Peter addressed them. Now listen to what he says. You know, I'm sure that this is highly irregular. <laughs> Jews just don't do this. Visit and relax with people of another race. That's a bit of an understatement. 
Do you know, for century, like the, the hatred that, that Jews, kind of the contempt that they had toward Gentiles, I did a little digging, a couple things to know. Strict Jews would never associate with Gentiles. They would never be a guest in a Gentile's home. You would never walk over that doorpost and enter in. Dirt, did you know this? Dirt from a Gentile country was considered defiled to the point that when Jews literally walked through a Gentile region and came back into the Holy Land, they would shake the dust off of their feet so as to not contaminate God's holy soil. Man, that's hard. They would never share a meal with a Gentile, right? Because of the eating laws, because of clean, unclean. Gentiles didn't, didn't have the kosher menu that the Jews did. But probably the thing that nailed me the most was this. Gentiles were considered as a people who were unclean and defiled. Man, there was such disdain. So I, I love this time when Peter walks in and says, <laughs> well, this is certainly interesting, right? Um, not normal at all. But here's how I know that God had to do a work on Simon Peter, and here's why I believe Simon Peter had some things, some contempt that was stuck in the filter of his heart because of what he said next. Listen, he said, but God has just shown me that no race is any better than another. So just take a moment. Peter just had a powerful moment where the Spirit stretched him, where he responded, where he moved, where he stepped into a place that made him uncomfortable. And he's basically saying, in a sense, at the foot of the cross, the ground is completely equal. God doesn't see borders. God sees a people. He sees hearts. It's incredible. So the minute I was sent for, I came, no questions asked. But then get this, Pete says, but now I'd really love to know, why did you send me? <laughs> so I've been obedient, I'm here. What can I do for you? Cornelius said, four days ago, at about this time, mid-afternoon, I was home praying, and suddenly there was a man right in front of me, flooding the room with light, and he said, Cornelius, your daily prayers, your neighborly acts have brought you to God's attention. I want you to send to Joppa to get Simon, the one they call Peter. He's staying with Simon the Tanner down by the sea. So I did it. I sent for you, and you've been good enough to come, and now we're all here in God's presence, ready to listen to whatever the master put in your heart to tell us. How does Peter respond? Peter fairly exploded with his good news. It's God's own truth. Nothing could be plainer. God plays no favorites. It makes no difference who you are or where you're from. If you want God, you're ready to do as he says. The door is open. The message he sent to the children of Israel that through Jesus Christ, everything is being put together again. Well, he's doing it everywhere among everyone. The gospel's for everyone. He said, you know the story of what happened in Judea it began in Galilee after John preached a total life change. Then Jesus arrived from Nazareth, anointed by God with the Holy Spirit, ready for action. And he went through the country helping people, healing everyone who was beaten down by the devil. And he was able to do this. Why? Because God was with him. And we saw it. We saw it all, everything he did in the land of the Jews in Jerusalem, where they killed him, where they hung him from a cross, but in three days, God had him up alive and out where he could be seen. Now, not everyone saw him. He wasn't put on public display. Witnesses had been carefully handpicked by God beforehand. Us, we were the ones there to eat and drink with him after he came back from the dead. And he commissioned us to announce this in public, to bear solemn witness that he is, in fact, the one whom God destined as judge of the living and the dead. But we are not alone in this. Our witness that he is the means to forgiveness of sins is backed up by the witness of all of the prophets. I've said it before. This is one book, one story of God's relentless pursuit to capture the hearts of the children children that he loves. That's it. That's all Peter had. That's all he had. But no sooner 
than these words came out of his mouth, then the Holy Spirit came on the listeners. And the believing Jews who had come with Peter couldn't believe it. They couldn't believe that the gift of the Holy Spirit was poured out on outsider Gentiles, that the outsiders had become insiders in the house of God. But there it was. They heard them speaking in tongues, heard them praising God. Then Peter said, do I hear any objections to baptizing these friends with water? They've received the Holy Spirit exactly as we did. And hearing no objections, he ordered that they be baptized in the name of Jesus. And then they asked Peter to stay on for a few days. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Say it like you mean it. Thanks be to God. Do you, do you see it? Do you hear it? Is the Spirit stirring something? Look at what happens. Jesus Christ was preached. Jesus Christ was received. The Holy Spirit came with power on those who gathered there and baptism occurred. Revival broke out. Anytime Jesus is preached, when the Holy Spirit comes, you see this time and time again in Acts, that revival breaks out and people come to know the Lord. Acts 10 is a defining chapter in the story of God's people. Guess what? I'm a Gentile and I'm here today with a relationship with Jesus because of Acts chapter 10 and because of the obedience of Simon Peter to do the work that he needed to do in his heart to go bring this message to an audience that was captive, that was waiting for good news to be shared with them. Listen, you can't go where God wants you to go, but stay where you're at. You can't go with God and stay where you're at. One of the things that we need to be doing is we need to be developing this relationship with the Spirit and letting the Spirit stretch us. Why? Because this is what Jesus said the Holy Spirit would do. Remember when he told them in John 14, 15, and 16 about the coming of the Spirit, he said, I know I'm not gonna be with you forever, but I actually am. Here's why. Because the Holy Spirit is going to come. He's not Casper the friendly ghost. The Holy Spirit is the third person of the Trinity that was gifted to us that began in Pentecost. A couple things Jesus says about the Spirit. Why you can expect to be stretched. In John 14, 26, Jesus said, but the counselor... The Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything that I have said to you. Remember, the Holy Spirit is a teacher. Jesus said the Spirit will teach you. Peter still needed to be taught in his life. There were still things he needed to know. How great, wow, it's 1031. How great that It would have been if Jesus, right before he ascended into heaven, pulled Pete aside and said, hey, Pete, about six years down the road, there's going to be this guy named Cornelius. I'm going to do this thing. (laughs) All right, spoiler alert, don't tell anyone. They're going to be so mad at you. But spoiler alert, Gentiles are also going to be a part of his club. They're going to be a part of his family. How great would that have been? Jesus didn't do it. Why? Because Jesus knew in the coming of the Holy Spirit, he was going to continue to teach Simon Peter. Simon Peter was being stretched. Simon Peter was just being pulled because the Spirit was still teaching him. He is a teacher, John 16, 13. But when he, the Spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own, but he will speak only what he hears, and he will tell you of what is yet to come. There are things just around the corner that we as the children of God need to know about. How do we know those things when we invite the Spirit into our everyday lives to say, Spirit, what are you teaching me in this moment in our nation's history? What are you teaching me in this moment of conflict? What are you teaching me? Where are the places I can go? Is there a Cornelius in your life that is just waiting for you 
to cross a boundary and to speak a message of hope that's found in a relationship with Jesus. So where does this meet us today? As the band comes up on the stage, I need another hour and a half. (laughs) Where does this message reach us today? It reminds us of two things, that we need to grow spiritually and we need to go faithfully. Grow spiritually. Continue to invite the Holy Spirit to convict you. Continue to address the sin in your life. Peter did it. But on the other side of growing spiritually, you, you also have to go faithfully. You gotta live a gospel message that has feet, that is willing to step into uncomfortable places to bring the message and the hope of who Jesus is. I tell you, my conviction is, is this. What you do is so much more important than how you feel. What you do is so much more important than how you feel. I I wonder if, I wonder how many times Simon Peter went back to Luke chapter five. It was the very first moment that he had an encounter with Jesus. He's, um, he'd been fishing all night. He hadn't caught a thing and Jesus walks up and there were people that were following him, so Jesus, duh, just gets into Simon Peter's boat. What a great way to introduce yourself and say, hey, would you mind pushing out a little bit? I need the amplification of the water to preach to the masses. By the way, Jesus still steps into whatever your job is, whatever your occupation is, and preaches to you. And there's Simon Peter just sitting in a boat and Jesus is preaching a message and as soon as he's finished, he looks at Simon Peter. He's like, hi, I'm Jesus. Simon Peter's like, hey, Simon. And Jesus looks at his friend and he says, hey, why don't, you, um, why don't you push out into deeper water and throw out your net? And what does Simon do? Simon looks at Jesus and he's like, it's so sweet. Look at that. Yes, I should, right? Yeah. See, you're, you're a preacher, so that's kind of what you do. I'm, <laughs> I'm a fisherman. Don't you smell me? <laughs> so I've been fishing all night, Lord, and really haven't caught a thing. Kind of know what I'm doing. Listen to what happens. There's something about the way the master spoke to him. That Simon said these words. But if you say so, I'll do it. And he pushes out the deeper water. And he casts out that net. And he pulls in a catch unlike anything he had ever seen before. And when he realized he was in the presence of the Messiah, of the Savior, the scripture says that he fell to his knees, dropped down. The message translation translates it. He says, I am unable to stand in the midst of this holiness, but Jesus looks at Simon Peter and he says, Simon, You're gonna leave this profession, but you're gonna become fishers of men. So all that's necessary is that we as a people of God cast a wide net. All that's necessary is that as we dig in to the leading of the Spirit in our lives, as we deal with our conviction, as we see sin in the world and injustice in the world, racism, hatred, you name it, sin has a lot of different shades. May we be bold enough to walk into uncomfortable places to say all are seen, all have value, and all are welcome in the presence of God. The one who was, the one who is, and the one who is to come. This is good news for the whole world. So if our Cornelius is waiting, let's get to work. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and God's people said, amen, amen.